and welcome to the First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. My name is Andrew, and I'm a member of the board at First U. It's good to be with you. If you are new to First U and would like to learn more about us, please contact us through our email at welcome at firstunitarianottawa.ca. Following our service at 11.30 a.m., do join us as well for our virtual hospitality hour. You may find the Zoom link on our website at www.firstunitarianottawa.ca or in our weekly email newsletter, the EUU. It's more important than ever to sign up to receive the EUU, check our Facebook page and our web page for notices and updates. Our online calendar is as full as ever. We are looking with, for people with experience and interest to join the Finance Committee. If you are interested, please contact the Treasurer, Justine DeJager, and, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're also looking for more people to join the Embracing Diversity Committee, and if you're interested in, in that opportunity, please contact the Chair, Tara Patterson. Thank you to everyone who participated in the Campus Development Town Hall yesterday. Mark your calendar for March 27th for more information and discussion. Our online auction is just completed. Thank you for those who donated their treasures to the bidders and those who helped behind the scenes with intake, research and promotion. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love and however you identify, today you are a part of our spiritual community. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary, and I'm delighted to be your worship associate this morning. As mentioned, do look to our Facebook page, website, and weekly EUU emails for information about all the happenings in our congregation. And I do have some additional announcements to highlight. Do you identify as black, indigenous, or as a person of color? Would you like to connect with other BIPOC within the Unitarian Universalist community? If you answered yes to these questions, please consider checking out the recently formed Local Canadian BIPOC group. The group meets bi-weekly online via Zoom, and the next gathering is this Saturday, March 20th, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. If you're interested, please see the upcoming EUU for the Zoom link. This afternoon, and I repeat, this afternoon, from 2 to 4, all ages are welcome to our climate justice event, where you use from other Canadian congregations will join us to hear presentations by local young adult climate activists and participate in a Google Earth scavenger hunt in New York City. This is a registration event for the UU United Nations Office Virtual Spring Conference in April. Zoom link is in last Friday's EUU. From the Environmental Action Group, we are now in week four of our food challenge continuing through Earth Day week. Food waste thrown into garbage or landfills creates methane. Try to purchase only the food you need and to use up leftovers. Week four is action. If you have food scraps, compost or green bin them. Even better, Go to the climate confrontation page on our First U website to see our EnviroBite recipes and make compost soup. It's not too late to start the food challenge and there will be prizes for participants. Just keep your challenge sheets until Earth Day week. Finally, our congregation is supporting the Ontario Clean Air Alliance in their push to phase out gas-powered, excuse me, to phase out gas-fired power in Ontario by 2030. You can personally support OCAA by sending a letter to provincial leaders. For links and more info, see the EUU and the Climate Confrontation website page. And now, please welcome our minister, the Reverend Patricia Guthman Haresh. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Andrew. Bonjour, good morning, everyone. I congratulate you all 
who were able to spring forward and set your clocks right. If you're right now here with me, 10, 20 something Eastern time. Uh, this morning we will be talking about where our UU symbol, I got it right here, of the flaming chalice originated from. It's a story of intrigue and courage, risking one's life to uphold one's ideal and save others, even when risking our own life. So before we light our chalice this morning, I will read a portion of a meditation from Reverend Jan Tadeo. We cross bridges and borders as we learn to navigate the multicultural world around us that challenges us to expand our worldview and embrace new ways of engaging a changing world. Whether we are crossing a bridge from a place of comfort to challenges we never anticipated or from our own cultural norms to completely new worldviews, we have resources, friends, and mentors to guide us. For this amazing journey, we carry in our backpacks a sense of wonder, a sense of humor, and a lot of courage. Our compass is the compassion we hold for others, that we hold for our neighbors. Our sustenance is the joy of discovering our true selves and experiencing the divine in one another. Our map is the sacred covenant we hold with one another to walk this journey together. With so many tools to guide and support us as we approach new bridges, it is not such a leap of faith to trust that we will arrive at the distant shore. Together we can boldly go where our vision and our faith call us to go. May it be so. everyone on this Sunday. It's Neo, your Director of Religious Exploration. Hope everyone is doing great. Uh, today I'm sharing with you a story about the chalice from Reverend Pat. During our Sunday service, before many of our lessons and meetings, we will light a candle or lamp in what we call a chalice. On our website and other places, you will see the picture of a chalice with a flame. It has been the official symbol of Unitarian Universalism for 60 years. The picture of the flaming chalice is even older than that. It was a symbol that Unitarians started to use in World War II in the 1940s. Can you believe that this treasured symbol came out of war? During World War II, the Nazis who were in control of the country of Germany were trying to wipe out all the Jewish people in the countries they took control of. The Unitarian Service Committee heard about this and of both important Jewish artists, sci scientists, those who spoke out against the Nazis and Unitarians who were the first and Unitarians who were the first who the Nazis were after and threatened. The Unitarian Service Committee put together a plan to bring these people to safety. Headquartered in the country of Portugal, the director of the Service Committee, the Reverend Charles Joy, started to oversee a secret ne network of couriers and agents sneaking into places where the Nazis controlled to bring the these people out. But they needed paperwork that looked official that would convince the Nazis. Hans Joich was an artist who drew cartoons against Adolf, Adolf Hitler, the leader of the Nazis. 
when he was living in Paris, France, and the Nazis invaded, Hans escaped finally to the country of Portugal. There he met Reverend Joy. Hans didn't know anything about Unitarians, but he was so impressed with that with what the secret with what the service committee was trying to do that he quickly put together the design. A chalice is a big decorative cup for wine, usually used in religious and important ceremonies. He quickly drew the picture of the flame being in a chalice with a circle. This, this symbol appeared on the papers and badges for the agents helping people to safety. When the Unitarians and Universalists merged together in North America in 1961, it became a symbol of Unitarian Universalism all around the world. I hope everyone enjoyed um, that little piece, and I'm wishing everyone a really wonderful Sunday. Take care. Mayo. This is the time when we can send our earnest hopes or wishes, which some people call prayers, to the people who we care about. I invite you to think about your relationship with this community and how it can support you in the good times and the not so good. Think about your hopes and your hurts and how sharing them with like-minded people can make you feel. During this COVID time, which now seems to be sort of interminable, although there is light at the end of the tunnel, but it's still difficult to get together with people. Um, vaccination is rolling out, so hopefully soon enough we'll be able to meet in person. But at the moment, it's still a bit tricky. So please reach out as much as you can by phone or by Zoom, or if you can do so safely in person. Let us also lift up those who are ravages, who are persecuted for their beliefs, and those who have experienced the ravages of war or the pain of bigotry. Those whose lives and livelihoods are, have been uprooted by violent weather. Those who are homeless or starving, while most of us live in relative abundance and all of those who are lonely in the need and in the need of company, those who are imprisoned, those who mourn and are in need of comfort, those who are victims of violence, and those who are suffering from an illness of body, mind, or spirit, may they find comfort and healing in the days ahead. Let us hold these people and all people in our hearts and minds. This is the time when people can express their personal joys and sorrows 
And we do this by putting stones into water, which creates ripples, taking those hopes or wishes out into the universe. A stone for Mackenzie, 20-year-old granddaughter of Marg and great-grandniece to Jan. She died much too young and too soon. For Christine, thinking of you and sending best wishes for as you begin treatment. For the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Ottawa, or the East End Congregation, as most of us call it, are celebrating their 25th anniversary today. Uh, many of you may remember when they started out as a, as a companion piece to this congregation. So Fred and Bonnie Cappuccino, who of course were instrumental in founding that fellowship, will be there by Zoom. And sadly, we are celebrating or commemorating or commiserating with the one year anniversary of COVID this week. And to the many people who have been dealing with COVID either personally or with family or friends. And it's been a year since we closed the doors to this congregation. So it's important to remember, and I'll put a stone in for this, that our church is not only our building, our church is us, the people. And a little stone, well, fairly big stone, to recognize the stress of COVID, particularly the impact on students and young people for whom childhood, tween, and teenage years already difficult to navigate and are now being made more difficult, and for young adults trying to strike out on their own. And one last stone to, to commemorate the thoughts and concerns and joys that are in our hearts. May we be safe with them. We will have a moment of silence. The reading is from UU World Article, Righteous Among Nations, by Michelle Bates Deacon. On a snowy night in Prague in 1939, Martha Sharp jumped from a taxi, darted around a corner, and flattened herself into a doorway. The heels of a pursuing Gestapo agent clicked past her. She entered an unlit apartment building, dashed up five flights of stairs, and rang the bell of a known anti-Nazi leader. A woman opened the apartment door to Martha, denying she'd even heard of the man Martha was asking for. I begged, Martha recounted the story later to a biographer. I told her there was little time. I produced my American passport. When she saw it, she said in check, a moment, and then snatched my passport from me and shut the door in my face. For the next few minutes, Martha frantically wondered whether she'd see her passport again. But the door did open, and this time a man stood before her. Martha asked if he was Mr. X, as Martha later referred to him when she told the story. He said he could give Mr. X a message. She explained she had been charged by a group of British and American 
refugee workers were transporting him to the British Embassy so he could be smuggled from the country. The man asked her to wait a moment, then disappeared into the apartment. He opened the door again, wearing an overcoat. He handed Martha her passport and said, I am Mr. X. Together they walked through wind and snow across the city. A Nazi soldier stopped them when they reached a bridge over the Voltava River. Martha produced her passport and confidently announced, Americans. They were waved across the bridge, then stopped by another soldier on the other side. The passport trick worked again. Just steps outside the British Embassy, a third Gestapo officer stopped them. Martha began to loudly complain about the lack of taxis and her frustration at being late for a meeting with the embassy secretary. She flashed her passport and demanded the guard tell the secretary, Mr. and Mrs. Sharp are here. He waved them ahead to speak with the British guard and Martha and Mr. X walked into the embassy to safety. Martha then returned to her apartment where wait still, her husband, was returning from a similar mission. They watched out their window as Nazi soldiers looted Prague stores and warehouses. Now, you'd think what Mary just shared would be straight out of an old um, black and white movie. You know the one where um, someone says to someone, you'll see him under the street lamp wearing a red rose on his lapel, you'll ask him when the next bus comes and he'll pull out the vial for you, but don't open it because it's poison, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that uh, what Mary just shared sounded like, total film noir stuff. Hardly possible that it would be a story connected to our beautiful UU flaming chalice symbol or the chalice we light every Sunday morning. But Mary's story was about real people, real Unitarians who risked their lives to help rescue imperiled people from the Nazis. Last Sunday, uh, last Sunday night, we had a Zoom newcomers event, Mary was there, where I promised I'd tell the full story of where our flaming chalice symbol came from. And so I am today, and, and it's a good story. The story begins just before World War II. In 1937, 1938, as part of his duties, a Dr. Robert Dexter, who was the head of the social and international departments of the American Unitarian Association. So that was the Unitarians, um, a national organization before the Unitarian Universalist Association in 1961. Um, he was visiting our largest UU congregation in the world ever, a congregation in Prague led by the uh, Reverend Norbert, Norbert Chopik, who you may remember uh, created the UU Flower Communion service. And uh, part of the reason why Dr. Chopik's church was so big, his congregation was so big, is because a lot of people were coming who were refugees from the Nazis. In his visits to Czechoslovakia, Dr. Dexter became aware through, through these visits of the plight of Jewish refugees, especially fleeing the Nazis. In 1938, Dox, Dr. Dexter traveled with a Quaker gentleman from the American Friends Service Committee visiting uh, Geneva, London, and Paris and sent back a report that at least or over 20,000 refugees would need immediate immigration assistance. A Unitarian minister and former vice president of the American Unitarian Association, the AUA, the Reverend Charles Joy was between jobs and asked by Dr. Dexter to help develop a Unitarian service committee to be patterned after the American Friends Service Committee. And their first project, not a small one, 
their first project was nothing less than to assist thousands of Eastern European refugees escape the Nazis. Reverend Joy took the job. Also paying attention to these early clouds of war were the Reverend Waitstill Sharp, a Unitarian minister, and his wife Martha, who had been educated as a social worker. Around this time, they had started an international relations club and led discussions about what was starting to happen in Europe. According to the Sharp's late son, Hasty, I love that name, Hasty, short for Hastings, uh, according to Hasty, 17 ministers had turned down the offer to go to Czechoslovakia to help with the refugee rescue effort. His parents, the Sharps, were number 18. They were asked to, quote, undertake the first intervention against evil by the denomination to be started immediately overseas. The American Unitarian Association recruited Waitstill and Martha to go to Czechoslovakia in early 1939. When Waitstill was 37, year old, uh, 37 years old and Martha was just 34, they had two small children who were two and seven at the time. Hasty was the seven-year-old. You can imagine their dilemma. Do we answer the call from our denomination, the intervention against the greatest evil of our time? What about the kids? They were assured by those around them that their family, friends, and the congregation would care for the children. So in February of 1939, this all happened very quickly, they left the two little ones, headed to London and from London to Prague, where their work would begin. $40,000 was raised in that day for their mission, for food, medicine, and wool to be hidden in the basement of uh, Norbert Chopik's congregation in Prague. The money uh, also funded publications, group dinners for German and Austrian refugees, as well as support for students fleeing through Poland through February and half of March to help them to immigrate to, uh, to sa uh, safely around the world, the Sharps interviewed over 3,500 endangered people, both Jews and Gentiles, many who had become a part of the Unitarian Church in Prague. On March 15, 1939, so fairly soon after they arrived, the Germans came to Prague immediately 250,000 people in Prague were at risk. Using Waitstill's status as a minister to remain in Prague, maybe this would have been the moment you would decide to leave, but they decided to use the fact that he was a minister to remain in Prague. The Sharps, uh, in this way, brought refugees to the intention of the different embassies to help them find safety found scholarships and employment opportunities that would make uh, immigration easier, and secured releases of refugees from prison. But don't think that uh, their activities went unnoticed, because um, they started to travel regularly to further their cause. On just one trip, Martha led 35 refugees to safety in England. As the situation grew worse, they um, would start to bring food and medicine for the Unitarian congregation in Prague and worked with the Salvation Army to provide meals to refugees. In four months, they helped to feed 350 people who were fleeing the Nazis and helped 284 to escape the country. These activities, as I said, were being watched and in April of 1939, the Sharps' offices were broken into and their files were clearly searched. Luckily, as soon as they learned that the Germans had come to Prague about a month ago, they had destroyed most of their papers. But four days after that break-in, 
Martha arrived back in her office and found their files scattered all over the street. Their time in Prague was numbered. By the end of July, their office, along with other foreign refugee offices, were closed by the Nazis. After months of perilous service, the Sharps came to the attention specifically of the Gestapo. After Waitstill left Prague briefly for a meeting in Geneva, he was not allowed to return to the city. Martha continued their work on her own until she left later that year. She would come to find out that she was due to be picked up by the Gestapo a day before, uh, or, or the day after she left. So if she had stayed one more day, she would have been picked up by the Gestapo. After the Sharps traveled back to the US, Germany would invade Poland and World War II was in full tilt. Back home, the Sharps got together with Dr. Dexter and Reverend Joy and formally organized the Unitarian Service Committee in May of 1940. And by the way, I should say, uh, five years later, Dr. Lada Hitchmanova would start the Unitarian Service Committee in Canada for those new members that joined us virtually on Sunday. If you've never been in the sanctuary before, when you come in, you can have a little treasure hunt and see if you can find the bust of Lada Hitchmanova in the sanctuary. Of course, one of the first official acts of the service committee was to ask the Sharps to go back to Europe. Now you can imagine how many times they had already risked their lives and, and now they're finally with their kids, right? So can you imagine, hey, <laughs> the Gestapo knows about you. World War II is raging. Why don't you set up an office in Paris and continue your work, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> but guess what they did? They decided to go back to Europe and continue their work. The day before the Sharps were to return to Europe, the Germans marched into Paris. So unfortunately, no trip to Paris, but undaunted, the Sharps flew to Lisbon in the summer of 1940, where Reverend Joy had, had set up a service committee office. They provided a, a documentation, uh, or really fake documentation, and resources to refugees fleeing Nazi Germany, France, fascist Spain. They focused on political activists, academics, and intellectuals who were wanted for speaking out against government oppression or in favor of alternative political parties, alternative to fascists or the Nazis. Um, other refugee organizations didn't tend to help those people because they were so wanted by the Nazis. And they were, other organizations were reluctant to take the cases that the service committee would take. Children whose families had been lost or families who wished to send their children overseas for safety were of special interest to Martha. Again, remember, she was a mom but also had studied as a social worker. In one case, she learned that the Germans had commandeered all supplies of fresh milk and that refugee children in southern France were suffering as a result. The Sharps arranged for the purchase of a train car uh, full of condensed and powdered milk, which was shipped to Marseille and distributed in the city of Pau. The city bestowed a Medal of Honor on Martha, and today there is a memorial in the town hall of Pau commemorating that delivery. They are also on the wall of the righteous at Yad Vashem, if, if you go there as well. Um, it's interesting how few real honors they've received. One of their more daring exploits was to escort the internationally famous and noted anti-Nazi novelist, Lion Fuchwanger and his wife out of Vichy, France, through Spain and into Portugal where they all sailed to New York. 
Uh, just like Mary's story and the reading before the sermon, this is a good one to share. Just one of their many adventures of Weitzel and Martha. Lyon was on a speaking engagement in the U.S. when Hitler ascended to power. Lyon was advised by the German ambassador not to return to Germany. So instead, he settled with his wife, Marta, in south of France, thinking that would be safe. When World War II broke out, Lyon was on Hitler's most wanted list and was interned in a refugee camp. His wife, Marta, with the help of the American Council, engineered a, an escape from the camp, and they fled to Marseille. In Marseille, the Fuchwangers were introduced to the Sharps, who were there at the behest of no less than President Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor. When Wade still met the couple, he said, I am here to help you leave France. Martha rented a room in a hotel which was attached to this train station by a tunnel. One evening, the Fuchwangers slipped into Martha's room, and from there they went through the tunnel to the train platform where Waitstill was waiting. And there the adventure really began. The train passed through the foot of the Pyrenees, and with knapsacks on their backs, they walked through the vineyards and up through the mountains. Uh, caught with a suspicious passport, a customs officer was bribed with cigarettes, Short of money to get to Lisbon, Wade still knocked on the door of the American Council where they were and got some money, enough to continue their journey. When a journalist recognized and called out Fuchwanger's name, an irritated Wade still sharp reprimanded, shut up or someone might lose their life. In Lisbon, they, turned, uh, they learned from Dr. Joy that the Nazis were starting to abduct and kidnap famous refugees. In Lisbon, they learned, uh, and so Martha gave up, well, they had a planned airplane flight to the U.S. And Martha gave up her seat on the plane so that Lyon could accompany Waitzel, and they flew to New York, with Lyon's wife leaving two weeks later, and it just leaves you breathless, right? And this was so many times they did this, so many close calls. One of Martha's last acts in, in this work that they did overseas was to smuggle 29 children and 10 adults from Marseille, Marseille to New York. She sailed from Lisbon to New York herself in December 1940 with two of the children and four of the adults and the remaining children and adults sailed separately on a second ship. Martha was there to meet that second ship when they arrived in New York. But before I say more about the Sharps, you may be thinking, what about the chalice? Neo told much of the story earlier today. At the service committee office in Lisbon, Reverend Joy supervised a secret network of couriers and agents like the Sharps who smuggled out Nazis and Jews. The Sharps weren't the only ones. In that network was an artist named Hans Deutsch. As Neo noted, he was a Czech cartoonist, a noted anti-Nazi and a Jew. Deutsch fled Prague when the Germans took over and went to Paris. He left Paris in 1940, then went into hiding in southern France, then Spain, and eventually Portugal on an altered passport. There he met Reverend Joy. Deutsch was so impressed by Joy and the service committee. He later wrote to Joy telling him of his admiration of Joy and the service committee people's self-denial and readiness to help and serve. In their cloak and dagger world, official looking documents, some sort of symbol was key. It was a message to the secret network and the refugees, but it also impressed the officials. Reverend Joy hired Deutsch to come up with some sort of symbol that would look official and could be put on stationary documents and badges 
that the refugee workers wore. Joy wrote to the AUA Boston headquarters, quote, a document may keep a man out of jail, give him standing with the government and police, and it's important that it look important. Uh, about the chalice symbol uh, that De Deutsch drew, Joy said, I think it might well become the sign of our work everywhere. Uh, time proved, Reverend Joy right. It became the Unitarian, then the Unitarian Universalist symbol after the two denominations merged in 1961. Our flaming chalice symbol actually helped save lives. A friend and colleague of mine, a UU minister, Allison Cornish, has an aunt who was rescued by the service committee. I know some of you were thinking about something else if you're like me. What happened to the kids, right? The brother and sister, Hasty and his sister, were actually separated when the Sharps traveled to Europe and raised separately during that time. The little girl was even hospitalized with pneumonia while they were away. I think it did leave some scars on the children, but they came to understand how many lives their parents saved and touched. Waitstall and Martha remained a step ahead of the Gestapo for six years while guiding immigrants to safety in England and the United States. But sadly, the frequent separations they endured was hard on the marriage, and they subsequently divorced, but both remarried. I mean, this is the part in the movie, right, where you find out what happens to all the people. Waite still returned to ministry and later accepted a position in Cairo with the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. Martha continued her remarkable work. On one occasion, she traveled to Iraq on a secret diplomatic mission that led to the release of thousands of Jews from Baghdad jails. After an, and she even ran uh, for office after an unsuccessful bid as a Democratic congregational candidate in 1946. She joined uh, President Truman's administration as special assistant to the chairman of the National Security Advisory Committee and also served as associate director of civil defense. I think uh, it was her daughter who said she, became, she was a church mouse who became part of the White House. A ninth grade boy named Artemis Chikauki III had an assignment to interview someone of moral courage. He wondered what moral courage meant. He asked for his mother's advice. She suggested he interview his own grandmother, Martha Sharp. Artemis was like, what did she do, right? Now you know that she and Waitstill had done a lot. But if you can believe it, he was in ninth grade and it had never been discussed before. He interviewed his grandmother, learned about moral courage, and it turned into a lifelong search to uncover his amazing family story. When Martha died in her 90s in 1999, Artemis discovered boxes and boxes of materials, documents, letters, and case files of the people she helped to rescue. And they don't even know how many because of uh, so many files were destroyed. And from those uh, papers, he, uh, and in meeting a Unitarian, Ken Burns, the famous historical documentary filmmaker, uh, through that meeting together, uh, Artemis co-directed a documentary on his grandparents uh, with Ken Burns and wrote the book of the same title, Define the Nazis, the Sharps War. Uh, that was in 20, uh, 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 two, uh, 2016, and really it uh, brought again to uh, the world's attention the work of the Sharps. Uh, you can purchase the book and the video. You can go Google them. Define the Nazis, the Sharps War. It's a, an amazing documentary. For Artemis, the legacy of the grandparent story 
is that anyone, even a church mouse, can help one way or the other. There are so many ways to provide help. You don't even have to risk your life to become a hero like the Sharps did. The first time Artemis met his grandmother was that ninth grade assignment. So if you can imagine, he hadn't even met his grandmother. So that tells you a little something about the family dynamics, doesn't it, maybe? At that time, he was just discovering that he had a genetic disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Martha would come to the hospital and say to him, listen, you're not going to feel sorry for yourself. Let's go volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club. Get out of your own self-pity. Focus on others. That was Grandma's message when it's Martha Sharp. <laughs> he shared that was her kind of mentoring to him. To not be, uh, he said, in my own process, but to engage with the world and do something for others. Will you ever look at the chalice the same again? It actually saved people's lives in many different ways. When we look at the chalice again, let us remember to engage with the world and give to the world the way in which we can. There are so many ways to help. So let us sing number 1028 from our teal hymnal, The Fire of Commitment.
thank you for joining us this morning at First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. This is the time in our service that we usually accept the offering. You may go to our website or contact our finance manager to find out how you might keep up with your pledge or make a donation during these very unusual times. We give these gifts freely. We receive these gifts gratefully. We dedicate these gifts to the work of the congregation, serving human wholeness, caring for the planet, upholding religious freedom, welcoming the stranger, loving one another. Before we extinguish our chalice this morning, I actually found a blessing written in honor of the Sharps by the uh, UU Reverend Andre Mall. And I'll read this in part. When I say your life matters, that is where compassion begins. When I open the door to greet you, that is where hospitality begins. When I venture out to bring you shelter, that is where love begins. When I risk my comfort to ease your suffering, when I act against hatred, violence, and injustice, that is where courage begins. When we experience the full presence of each other because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where holy gratitude begins. May this space be a table that is not complete until all are welcome. May this table be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles and where all that we share is sacred. May it be so. As you go about your day on this sunny, blustery day, may you carry within you a bit of this place, a bit of that chalice of hope and courage, knowing every little thing you do makes a difference. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love. Mm -hmm. 